Welcome to this FEI Coach Education webinar on football fitness. I'm Gareth Marr. I'm delighted to be joined by FEI Coach Education Coordinator Craig Sexton and former Republic of Ireland International and Cork City legend uh, Joe Gamble, who's currently Assistant Manager and Strength and Conditioning Coach with Cork City. Thanks, lads, for joining us. Um, quite quite simply, I suppose, go to you, Joe, straight away. Um, I suppose it's synonymous, isn't it, football and fitness people who just think it's you know they, they go together like bread and butter like you know but it's what is it in the in the modern context of uh, football fitness uh good question um it's a lot of aspects really i suppose if you're looking at the, the modern day professional footballer you're looking at you know injury prevention you're looking at uh modern ways to train with the gps units uh weight training not just on the pitch and uh, so there's a whole I suppose a whole host of things with an SSC coach when it comes to football players. Um, but ultimately, for me, for me, everything football pitch and everything has to happen with the football. So the, the modern way of training football is no you see compared to, especially when I played with pre-season, you would see the ball for two weeks. You, you know, it, that was just the way it was. You just, you would run an awful lot, but straight from the bat, now you'd have lads uh, coming back from, from the off-season into pre-season in better condition. So it enables managers and coaches to get footballs out straight away and work on football fit, fitness aspects um, straight off the bat. Craig, that, that's an important point, isn't it? Because using the football, it's players are going to enjoy it a lot more, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's something that we've been we've been big in terms of coach education and, and, and getting this message across that team tactics and football fitness can be trained as a byproduct. It's kind of how creative you want to be within that. So whether you set up football sprints, drills, whether it's, um, practices with 77, 99s. So it's it's your organization and your your creation around the drill is the big thing. And and that can that can allow that football actions to take place. And if football actions are taking place, it means you're you're improving them as a player, potentially you're improving the team together. And then that'll allow the football fitness to kind of come together as well, which is which is helpful. And, and players will buy in certainly if the balls are involved and um, it's almost hidden running, isn't it at times? And that's that's what players want. It's 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 more reflective of what football is, isn't it? Because I suppose you know I'm sure we've all been through it, like and many people have had the horror stories of doing twenty laps of a pitch or running up and down hills or mountains or beaches and and stuff like that. But we have to make it reflective of the game, don't we, Craig? In terms of you know it's short, sharp. It's using the ball. It's it's being able to accelerate, deaccelerate, and stuff like that. Slow down and. Definitely, it's it, football's an interval sport, whether we like it or not. And, and sometimes, as you said, the, the old stories of, of running around the pitch look like a steady state type of training and, and running at one pace for four, five, six, twelve minutes, whatever it may be. I, I think them games have gone a little bit. I think everybody's a little bit more educated, and yet it should always look like the game where possible. Um, so if if it's acceler accelerating, decelerating, um, your your timings in your in your sessions is crucial. But can you make it look like football for the players, and can you help them meet the demands of the game? Because that's what ultimately what we want to try and do for a Friday or a Saturday. We're trying to expose the body to to what's required. Even even the point around accelerations and decelerations, people probably don't realise that you decelerate a lot more within a game than you would accelerate. Mm -hmm. um, and we probably don't replicate that within our training. And I know it's something that I've developed over the last few years that I wasn't aware of, and I've developed over the last few years that yes, you should incorporate decelerations into your into your sessions in whatever format that may that may be need to be in isolation ideally it's not ideally if your practices are creative enough and you've incorporated it within the organization of it i think that that will help but but certainly it will it will prepare your players for a friday or a saturday because you're, you're leaving them at, at less risk of injury joe when you were a player obviously you played very high level joe throughout your career was there a time when this clicked with you of you know things need to change here or was there a particular coach who did that for you? Uh, there was two instances actually I know to be honest I think the, the strength and conditioning and the fitness side of it uh, kind of for me took a big toll when I went to England um, you know my kind of when I first signed for a professional football club Reading um, I remember very very vividly kind of walking into a men's change room and I just kind of got overawed by the size of them you know the physical stature of them the power the pace and you know, I was a small, the scrawny lad from Cork, 18 years old, going over, and it kind of light bulb moment for me. You know, it really was where I kind of went right. Okay, if I want to compete at this level, I need to be physically at it. Now, for me, 
I probably went away from football fitness, though. I went to a gym head. I mean, I kind of went the opposite way, very big upper body, you know, very muscular, very small, but squatty type. Uh, and over the years, I kind of seen that that's not really the way modern football has gone or the way football has gone because, you know, it, like, as, as Craig said, it's an intermittent sport. You have to be able to move. But you have to be able to move in football fitness, too, and football-related, like acceleration, decelerations, high-speed running twisting and turning like it's not just about being physically strong taking a t-shirt off and looking looking the part you know you kind of have to kind of get to the situation where we train football is for the sport it's a foot bodybuilding it's not weightlifting you know it's so i think the two elements for me was one when i kind of went in england and two when i had a bad injury i i, I dislocated my kneecap i was out and i you know i was career injury to be potentially but the physio at reading uh who was Chelsea, John Fern, a uh, very good physio, he showed me an awful lot of what I should be doing and what I should not do. You know, he told me basically for the rest of my career, you can't do this, you can do this. And it kind of shaped my thinking. I evolved an awful lot more. And I got more and more into the, the fitness side of it. And, uh, and really, I think my longevity in my career would have been from my dedication to fo- uh, fitness and SNC and strength training and all that, really. Uh, if I didn't kind of... Uh, to those principles, I'm not too sure what I've played for 15, 16 years after I had injury. Joe, Joe, uh, Joe just in terms of, uh, you mentioned about you going to the gym and kind of bulking up, and that's mm-hmm. something that a lot of people will go to straight away, and there's many advantages to that, but mm-hmm. from a football perspective, could it be counterproductive almost, like to be carrying too much bulk? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I think, element. I mean, it depends, I suppose, what type of player you are, um, and I suppose your stature. I, suppose you, like, I mean, you have to have some sort of physical frame, no doubt about it. But there's a there's a point where what's the risk or the reward? Do you know what I mean? Like if you if you think of it, football is a play with your legs, you run, you jump, you tackle, you kick. Majority of your training. It's not the upper body. I mean the more the centre of gravity goes upper body when you're training too much, you know, uh, bench presses, pull ups, what have you. Um that's not really there's a certain element where that's fine, you're strong, you're strong enough to play football. But you can spend too much time, and I, I've seen for years, and I did it myself for years, doing too much of a body weight because you think it's the right thing to do. That's not the right thing to do. It's more lower body, hamstring, glutes, calves, or get them strong. The more they're strong, the less chance you've got of injury. That's, that's just it's a known fact. You know, the more resistance training you can do, that's replicated in training. You know, the, the right type of sessions, the right type of small side of games, the right type of sprints, all those combined with gym work. Gym work shouldn't just be the focus of, right, that's how I need to be injury prevention. That's not, that's one element of it. What you do on a pitch or what you do in the gym has to complement what you do on a pitch. It can't be one, it can't be the other way around. So, um, absolutely. And I, I, I would fall victim to that myself. I know, I, know I, I suppose I'm, I'm obviously older now, I can look back at it. Um, you know, it didn't hinder me too much, don't get me wrong, but it's definitely something I would have spent a lot of time doing when it was unnecessary. Sure. Craig, in, th- in terms of this, you know, modern way of looking at football fitness. What is the FUI coach education department doing now to kind of implement this for coaches and help coaches to to put it back into practice now? Yeah, so we we probably started five, six, seven years ago, maybe when when Jerry McDermott would have been instrumental really in in getting the periodization topic up and running on on certainly our UEFA license courses and. Um, probably would have had to break down a lot of barriers with, with coaches at the time because it was a new topic where it was, it was debatable and people might not have bought into it straight away and, and I think Jared done a brilliant job to break down them barriers um, and, and it's it's a topic now where, where, where it's everybody's probably a little bit more comfortable with um, because we've, we've really bought into it as a department and um, this way of thinking, the methodology and um, now we're, we're looking at a full pathway for football fitness. So we 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 went away to Joe was with us. Darren Dillon from Shamrock mm-hmm. Rovers was with us. We went away to um, Poland last year on a UEFA study visit. And um, UEFA brought us together uh, around the theory of football fitness. And we started to look at their best practice. We started to look at our own best practice that we use things like Raymond Vahans and um, types of models. And um, we've our own methodology with reality based learning with football actions. And we started to pull it all together really. Um, and we're looking at a full football fitness pathway. We've 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 started to roll out courses. We've rolled out a football fitness intro, and we, we'll have a football fitness D, C, B, and A. And the messages will consistently be layered on top of each other. So, our football fitness intro will be basically around football actions, giving giving coaches a platform to work from, and that they have an understanding of our methodology, 
Um, certainly at grassroots level, what's priority for a grassroots coach is getting the kids playing football. But can we sneak in the fitness elements and, and try and both as a byproduct? We need to be we need to be economical with our time at that level, at, at grassroots level. We only have a couple of hours a week to work with a player, so we can't waste 20, 30 minutes on isolated practices. So can we sneak it all together? And that, that's what we're thinking at that level. The license will start to we'll start to learn a little bit more information around football sprints, a little bit more research driven. Uh, C license will look like small sided games, the research around them, best practice for small, medium and large sized games. And the information will grow to A license will be around the professional game, kind of load monitoring, GPS, um, the role of the S&C coach, basically. And they'll they'll kind of tie in with the UEFA license course as well, Garrett. So there'll be the, the information will be in line with with the corresponding UEFA license course. So a uh, football fitness B license will will the information will be relative to a UEFA B license coach, for example. And that's that's the way we've tried to layer it um, as best we can. So we're trying to we're trying to give uh, the coaches exposure to everything really and, and set them up well for for reality. It's a it's important there as you mentioned, Craig, the, the grassroots coaches because that's where players are introduced to football practice isn't it like that's what you know the the language of football you know like the disciplines of football like behaviors as well as technique as well so you know i remember my school boy days like you know like you know sometimes tuesdays was technique thursdays was running or something and it was always in the same fellas were missing every thursday like you know when it was when it was running and fitness but if you are able to integrate that as part of a football module or you know as part of the training session grassroots coaches are going to really you know lap this up Definitely. I'm, I'm, and we're not reinventing the wheel here. And, and, and let's make that clear. We're, we're not trying to create this whole new idea around around training or, or how we set up our coaching practice. Absolutely not. It's probably more around just the theory element of it, why you're doing things, your organisation and what you're hoping to achieve. So your focus may be a football conditioning session that we feel like we're going to overload our players in, in whatever aspect. But you're also probably working on some element of team tactics. That may be in a 5v5 game that Mm-hmm. Your two centre backs, your number six and your number ten play in the right positions in a five v five game. So we're not now looking at just your centre back ending up as a centre forward scoring headers every ten seconds of a five v five. That there's a little bit of structure to what you're doing that their actions look like they're going to do on a Saturday. So their actions are relative on a Tuesday that that will be relative on a Saturday. So it's it's going to sneak in all together. Um, so your organisation is probably the crucial bit there for certainly the grassroots coach because we're not trying to change anything. We're not trying to add extra theory. It's just making sure that there's a little bit more of a thought process on what you're doing. That's all. With that in mind, Joe, for, for a grassroots coach that might be watching this, mm-hmm. would there be a couple of tips that you'd be able to kind of give them about, you know, what would be that inter- you know implementation phase of what they should do, like, you know, in those first couple of sessions after going so long during the lockdown of not being with their players? Yeah, I do always look, the, the first thing is don't be too excited to do too much. You know, just t- just t- take that back a little bit, you know, introduce football straight away, get some technical drills, um, you know, you know, your, your, your rondos, uh, uh, your small side of games, just make sure maybe the times are not so high, you know, don't let them go on for six, seven minutes, you know, do lots of maybe one and two minutes. Uh, Make it reality based. You know, don't just do running drills for the sake of running drills because they've been out so long. You know, players want to play football. Uh, kids want to play football. So if you can manipulate the training and uh, make it fun and get what you want out of it, you you you'll get them fit by default anyway. You'll get them fit by playing small side games. You'll get them fit by playing medium side games. When you start running players just for the sake because we've been out so long, that's when you you lose them, uh, especially at a young age. And, uh, to, there's obviously you have to do it some part. There's no doubt about it, but it has to be relevant to the game. I think you always go back to the game, go back to the game, and play as much football as you can within the game, and you will definitely get them fit. It's a fantastic point, Craig, isn't it? Like you know, make it fun. Absolutely, and especially if we're speaking about the grassroots element, they need to enjoy a force, and they need to want to be at training. And if you can, as I keep going back to it, sneaking in them little bits of. Of extra bits that you want, sneak them in somehow. Be creative in what you do. It's and like just a part of sneaking the vegetables in, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is, and 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 I think coaching needs to be a little bit like that at times. It needs to be one for them and one for you. So it's give them what they want at times. But how can you sneak in what you need all the time? And if if playing a seven v seven, um, or a nine v nine, or a five v five, or a two v one into the goal, whatever it may be, these different types of practices, 
if we're playing them, they're probably getting what we need as a coach or they're getting their football actions. It looks like the game and we're probably getting the physical output that we that they require as well. So we're, we're kind of getting a little bit of everything there. So to kind of add on from Joe's point as well as, as kind of a message, we need to make sure that we slowly do it, absolutely, and make sure that we mind our players as, as we go back into that implementation phase. A, a common trend might be that if we find our players are getting tired near the end of training, an old age thing might be to let's do an extra 10 minutes, let's do an extra 15 minutes because we need to make them fitter, and that might be an old, older way. I think the newer way of thinking, and, and I know Joe would certainly be on the same lines here, would be as soon as we see the quality of the session going and, and we feel like our, our players have done enough, at that point that needs to be stopped. Um, and that's now kind of like your, your player zero point. That's your reference point now to say if we played three five-minute 77 games and we just after, in the third game of five minutes um, our players are done after four minutes, that's, that's our reference point. So the next time we go back to that game, we need to make sure that we get that third game into the fifth minute and the sixth minute and we and we grow our games like that. So that, that's kind of like a kind of our, our loading, understanding our players' loading and understanding how we can manipulate that and manage that a little bit. Joe and, and myself and and people within the elite game have load monitoring systems that we can use, GPS systems that we can use, and, and they, they help us massively. But people on the ground and grassroots coaches and underage coaches might might not have access to this stuff. So they need to find figure out ways to be to be on the same lines as us and on the same wavelength and make sure that they manage players' loads because it's crucial. It's crucial because if we keep consistently overloading players, we're running the risk of burnout, out and the players will stop coming back because they'll stop enjoying it because because they're not enjoying the game itself. Joe, is, does, does, that, does that mean that the days of kind of as Craig's kind of alluded to there, does that mean the days of pushing players to their extreme limits or leave tests and stuff? Are they are they gone those types of days? Like, well, I wouldn't say they're gone because look, you have to overload the body to get fit. That's just the basic requirement. So if you keep underloading, you're never going to meet those thresholds. But what Craig was probably alluding to is is too much all the time. So if you overload the body all the time, you put yourself in chronic fatigue. You you know you want players to. Some days are overload, some days are underload. So the underload days, the intensity doesn't change. And that's the that's the key here that we, we kind of need to get the coaches that intensity never really changes. It's the volume that changes. So you change the volume, you might go over the threshold maybe or, or get overload the body. Great. You don't come back the next day or the next day after and do the same session again and try to do more. You know, you get them you get them to recover a little bit. And you might do other elements of training. You might do tactical uh, team tactical sessions. You might do set pieces, whatever organization phase of play that are not overload. So you have the balance and um, go back. To, I mean, testing, fitness testing has to be overload. But like if you're doing a bleep test, it has to be the maximum. So you have to really ask the players to go all out and don't leave anything back. But that's not an every week occurrence. That's like an every three months, four months, six months. So that's only relevant. That's relevant in terms of maybe for, I, I would think maybe professional game. I don't see grassroots football as any benefit for, for, for bleep tests or yo-yo tests or you know really what are we getting at like what are we showing the players are we showing the kids that oh you need to get fitter not really i think for professional football or, or above brilliant you can show the players where we need to improve because you know there's a different element to, to that sort to the, to the to that level of football but i think for underage i think as craig made a very good point is having a very simple tool for yourself like you know if you do say for example small side games or medium size games have certain blocks and watch for the quality to drop, you know, that's a coach's eye, that's a skill that we've, on all the course, on all the courses I've been on, that's the, the one thing they've always said, you know, coach's eye, look for the game, look out, what, look, watch what you're looking for, sorry, and when you see that quality drop, sometimes you might leave a flow maybe a little bit for a minute, but not every single time, and then at the end of the session, you know, go, all right, we need to get more of, you know, let's be running, you know, the, it, I think the running has to be done within the game, and having the belief that it is right, and the more you do it, the more weeks that go by, the more months to go by, you'll probably see your players getting fitter and fitter and stronger and as, and, as we keep saying to enjoying more and more. Joe, part part of this process is is recovery as well, isn't it? And that like that's a that's a very important part of it, isn't it? It's huge. I mean look, you, you can only get really, really fit if you recover properly. You know, I mean, there's obviously a balance. You have to overload the body, you have to train really hard to get fit. But if you keep, as I said earlier, if you keep knocking in the door of overload, 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 you can't get fit because you're in just constant fatigue mode. So when you go to training, and like this is, look, a prime example, I, I would have had it before as a player. You play on a Friday night or a Saturday, you lose the game. You're not fit, lads. 
come Monday, Tuesday, you're going to get run to death. You're going to be a right tough session and a slog session. And then you come on Friday, are you actually are you more fitter? Are you are you actually in fatigue for the match on Friday? So that's that's the, that's the balance you have. It takes weeks. So like overloading takes weeks, and then you have to recover from that overload to get fitter. So there's certain and like you know on the courses that that we do, we'll we'll be able to show practical examples of this of certain training sessions and certain games have a delay of a fitness. So for example, you know medium side games would take you 48 hours to recover. Longer so longer eleven eleven games might take twenty four hours and so on and so forth. So there's different ways and different methods to recover from different games. So it's important that you know you you understand that, not just throw them out there and just hopefully that they work. Craig, like a lot of the stuff we're talking about is probably training related. There's also a football fitness element on match day, isn't there? In terms of uh, warm up and cool downs, half time as well. It's probably a key period. Certainly, um, and. Uh, over the last two to three years since I've been using GPS systems, for example, I've seen the the importance of warm ups. Um, and and it, a big thing that's been highlighted to me is it's going to your distance you're covering your warm up can can vary at times. And um, you probably don't realise how much you do within your organisation of your warm up that may need to be tailored back. Um, so you, you need to be careful with that as well because over a season that can accumulate massive massive numbers for you and the players can be doing big big distances. By you just being five minutes extra in your warm up, or your grid size could be slightly bigger, or whatever whatever way your organisation is. So yeah, you need to be careful with that as well. But but preparing your players to play is crucial, and um, and it's 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 getting them to to perform the right actions before the game for, for us. That that's important, um, and and I think it's a key one though, isn't it? Like we just because I sorry to cut across, but no? the first game we saw come back there, the Bundesliga, the German Bundesliga came back. Bruce Dortmund and uh, Gio Reyna, the young American kid, gets injured in the warm straight away and he's out of the game. And it looks like he's going to be out for a couple of weeks. And like that's, we've just spoken about, you know, the, you know that period of coming back from the lockdown where they haven't been doing too much. This is their first ever match and he's gone straight away in the warm up. Definitely. And I think it comes back to, I think this is the, this is how important we feel the, the pathway is now that we can educate our coaches. So if our coaches are educated right throughout the pathway now, that means that we should be able to educate our players. So if we can educate our players on the importance of their prehab in the changing room or that, or that area, that moment before you get out onto the pitch or the recovery that's led into whether it's the Thursday night recovery before your game on a Friday or the Friday night before you, your sleep patterns the night before the game, your food, your, your hydration, all everything that comes into play allows you to perform as an athlete. So we need to educate our coaches who can then educate our players. So that, that's that's the role we're playing in Coach Ed. But yeah, you're right, Garrett, it, it's crucial. Um, and and the last the, the last thing we need is an injury. We want our best players on the on the pitch at all times because that's what we want as as, as certainly in, in the professional game. Um, so we need to make sure they're fit on a Friday or Saturday because game day is probably the most important day of the week in, in the professional game. Mm. So we need to make sure that we have everybody right and ready and fresh as, as possible um, to play in that game. So it's our job during the week to, to monitor their loads, cr- be creative in our sessions, manage, manage them as best we can and make sure that, that they come forth whistle, that we've set them up in, in a correct manner. Yeah, you're dead right. And it's, it is important to have those players on the pitch, uh, particularly because I had Rain as first goal scorer in that game and he's obviously <laughs> not playing, you know. So uh, there you go. Joe, you mentioned some of the, uh, the research that you've kind of gone, obviously you've gone through a career as a player and you've experienced different things, Joe, in terms of Ireland, England, Brunei, like, you know, you've played, played for a country. But in terms of the research that's available to you now and, and that's available to any coach, you know, um, can you speak a little bit about that, like, of, of what people can actually kind of, pick up on quite easily um as, look I, I we live in the in the moment where everyone's online and the podcasts and you know you can probably be drowned down by i suppose the information for me i suppose and um, i've looked at i suppose a lot of intervention over the last few weeks just i suppose there's so much content out there and, and the importance of it i think if there was one i suppose um recommendation i would give to any coaches is to include a lot more sprinting in your training uh, not mean volume, but in just in terms of sprinting. Because the one thing I would have found, and I suppose I've worked with GPS now closely since January, Cork City, uh, I've had great uh, backroom 
Uh, it's from Statsports. They've been fantastic with all the information. I've been able to share, you know, what Arsenal do, what uh, Untrecht do, all these clubs that are top end. And it's been great to see what they do and what we do and, you know, the gaps in between and what have you. But one of the biggest things I would have seen was their, uh, their, their attention to detail to sprinting and to actually do sprints properly midweek. So what they would do, most clubs would do is... And I suppose, if, if you think of it in terms of, I suppose, uh, if I bring it, I suppose, and just basically break it down a little bit. If you look at a match, match this scenario, you would probably sprint an average, maybe 10 times, right, from GPS at our level, a professional level, you might sprint 10 times. And what would happen in during the week is you wouldn't sprint again in training. You'd feel like you're sprinting. You'd feel like you're doing, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm bursting, I'm accelerating. That's not classed as a sprint. There's a certain speed you need to get over to, to be classed as a sprint. So what they found was that a lot, a lot of hamstring injuries were happening because players weren't exposed to sprinting during the week. So they would train well and they, the, the, the sessions we, as, as Craig said, you know, they'd be creative, they'd be team tactical, they'd be everything you'd need to be doing, but maybe there's no sprinting involved. But yet you think as a player you're sprinting. So then Friday comes, you sprint 10 times, put an awful lot of stress on the body, on the hamstrings. All week then, for example, you haven't sprinted once. And then you go back into the game, you might do more sprinting because you're against a better team or the type of game, it, the physical demand is more. All of a sudden, then your players can't cope with it, or certain certain players can't cope with it, and you get a hamstring injury. You know that's criminal, really, because uh, there are things that can be prevented. Yeah, you can do a lot of strength training, and the train has to be very. Everything has to fall in place, not just sprinting. But for me, I, I would have looked a lot into the sprinting and the benefits of sprinting, proper sprinting, football sprinting, sprinting in isolation, sprinting, resistance sprinting, all the different elements. Because there's so much. Look. It's like a library full. Speed is, is categorised into so many different subforms of speed. But I think if we can get players to do more sprints, even if we're only three or four reps, quality, not quantity, it's not uh, it's not a case of, you know, we get 20 sprints and we just bash them out. It's just more of doing that, but including in the warm-up, including some sort of performance element in your warm-up. Uh, and for me, I, I, I would encourage a lot of our coaches to look at sprinting in, in terms of the weekly training. If, if you can combine that sprinting, as you say, with the intensity that you might mentioned earlier, mm. I suppose the result or the manifestation of that would be kind of maybe something like the Barcelona model of uh, the six second rule where you're, you're pressed and you're trying to win it back, mm. that you have the intensity there, but also the speed to be able to get to the player in time. Absolutely. I think, look, for me, look, if I had to pick one physical element for me as a physical, you know, as a footballer, I would pick speed. I think speed is crucial. I think the more the top end footballer, you know, if you're not quick, I don't know, can you actually be, you know, you can obviously, but I don't know. It's, a very, it's very difficult to make it. Very, very difficult if you're not quick. I don't mean using a ball quick. I don't mean a 100 meter sprint. I mean football sprint in terms of different characteristics, for different positions. But I think if you can shift as a player and be dynamic, you've got a great chance. Obviously, married with technical, tactical and tactical, everything has to fall off you. But as a physical element, I think if you, the quicker you are as a player, the, the, the more chance you can progress uh, to be a professional footballer. Craig, um, I know you mentioned you're doing a lot of work in this area. The coach head and it's going to be, become part of the new uh, FUI coach education pathway as well. You also had a conference recently, a first ever football fitness conference. Can you speak a little bit about that, like what, what you put on and, and what was the reaction to, to it as well? Yeah, so we, we almost seen it as kind of like a, a starting point for the for the pathway as such, um, getting it off the ground, exposing people to certain elements of, of the pathway that they're going to see, whether it was from some sort of grassroots elements to the top end, load monitoring um, elements of it. We, we had people who were spoke about long-term athletic development from their academy right through to their first teams, um fundamental movements all this kind of so we kind of exposed we, we wanted to showcase um small little snippets of, of what we will be teasing into the whole pathway from top to bottom um with 85 coaches there it was sold out and it was sold out weeks in advance um, it was our first event with some some brilliant guest speakers in with, with dylan Merna from qpr with darren dylan who was on the done a practical session with dan horan and um, from, from the fai we had Remy Tang from Bohemians. So we'd, we we had some really, really, really good people who, who, who offered a lot throughout the day. Jer McDermott kind of framed off where we've been previously from, from our content and where we're looking to take it now. So Jer kind of opened up the day around the work that he's put in for the last number of years. And, and now we looked at, we looked at as a group, 
kind of now our guest speakers brought in the new elements of, of what we're trying to achieve and the information that that people will see throughout the pathway so it was for us it was kind of like a a light bulb moment this is this is what we're trying to achieve for everybody and this is where we're looking to take it this this will be an annual event every year um along with with different conferences that we have and, and it's a part of our calendar now going forward and we think it's we think it's invaluable it, it's it's getting like-minded people together that that's that's the thinking behind it and, and sharing different content um as much as we can and almost creating mini community of practices um and because that's important as well that we get people who want to learn in the room together um, and, and they can share ideas, network, and um, develop together, because that's really important. It's 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 really key, isn't it? Because obviously, what we're talking about here in terms of football fitness is ultimately the players. But we have to educate the coach educators. We have to educate the coaches, don't we? That, that's our first job. So that's our first job. Is is from a, a department point of view, is is developing the educators. And um, so we have a panel of educators now that we're working off. We've also developed officers, and um, we were. Unfortunately, before the lockdown, we were due to have an event in Cork where we had a number of uh, development officers coming in. We were going to upskill them on on some of the new content because we've we've taken apart our old strength and conditioning course that's been rebranded basically in the new pathway. And um, so we need to upskill our, our our existing tutors, and we've got a new panel of experts as well working with us. So we need we need to educate them first, who can then educate the coaches on the ground, who can then educate the players, because the, the players are at the center of everything we do and, and they need to be always the end goal for whatever we do in coach education, it's for the player. Um there's a process that takes place first there. So we need to get to the educators to then get to the to the coaches who will then hopefully educate the players for us. Because we can't, as an association, we can't affect every player. And that's that that's that's the laws of, of numbers. So we, we need to make sure that we we get to the coaches, develop the coaches who will then disseminate all the information, our best practice information that we feel is is, is relevant. So I think player feedback is important throughout all of this, isn't it? The, you know, they'll know their bodies and how they're feeling. I suppose you're a little bit different in Cork, as you mentioned, you're working with stat sports, so you can actually yeah. see the evidence of, you know, how close a player is getting to burnout or you know the load uh, yeah. that they have but in your experience you know now as a you know obviously as a player but now as a coach if, if a player does come and say they just don't feel it or you know like how, how do you how do you react how, how does that relationship kind of play out like you know um i suppose look at the end of the day like stat sports or any gps unit that you have you know it's data, it's metrics. I mean, it doesn't tell you everything to be on every, and everything for every player. So feedback from players is more important than anything else. I think to have that buy-in, to have the feedback from the player, to have that sort of uh, respect for one another, that he, you know, he's been honest and, you know, and, and the feedback is, is, is good. And I think it's, it's valuable. I think you have to listen to players. I mean, uh, you can't just go on and bury head and stand and go, oh, well, look, the metrics say this and the data says this and this says that. And like, you know, it, it's, Communication is huge. Uh, me and say, look, you know, I'm not feeling it. I'm not. Don't feel as sharp. I don't feel this. Then we look more into metrics. I mean, there's like 200 metrics for every single session. I mean, no, no, S and C coach or any coach is going to want to see 200 stats or 200 metrics. You, you just don't do, it. and there's no need for that. You, you, you pick out the ones that are relevant to you and you look through them. And if you're consistent with looking at the same data all the time, you will have a pattern fall. So your sessions will will fall and different days will have different sort of metrics so um we would look at that and then i would i would go to the player and then you maybe look at you know previous injuries you know what have you done before you know you know weeks leading up to how you feel you know simple things like maybe going to see the doctor your nutrition there's no it's more things than just the way we train as craig said earlier sleep is probably the king of recoveries it's so important that you get your hours sleeping and you know you're not on the phone till 11 or 12 at night you're watching netflix you're on social media i mean these are all these are these are the devil really like for getting proper sleep you know and and these these are things that you educate players that put the phone away put the phone across the other side of the room go to sleep put your alarm on in the morning get up you know get get decent eight nine ten hours sleep as best possible um so there's more ways than just looking at the data uh, it, it has to be a whole a whole approach to the player and, and his lifestyle uh, and i would say more so it's lifestyle than, than just the training um that would be the issue Joe, you're obviously working with Neil Fenn as Cork City Manager there, and um, and obviously what you're bringing is the, the scientific, but also a realistic elements to what you're doing and what you're asking of the players. How many times have the players turned around and said, Joe, Neil, how many you didn't do all this running when you were a player? <laughs> Particularly <laughs> with know, the Neil, they know better not to. <laughs> 
No, I. Uh, to be fair, look, at the times have changed. I mean, players are, are willing to challenge you more. I mean, look, you know, definitely. Okay, I would have been a player, and a lot of players would have, would have been challenging to the manager, but more in argumentative way of both. Maybe you know, we clash clash heads, but players are much more educated and they'll come at you with different angles and you're like geez, that's a good question there now and you know and they test you more that way you know what I mean they're definitely much much more educated uh players will always have a moan about running or type of disguise running or whatever we put on you know players are players at, at professional level they'll always have a moan so you have to accept that but um i think you know i think as long as it's challenged in the right way that's okay i, I think if players are moaning because they don't want to do and no matter what you give them and they're moaning then they're just bad characters you just got to shift them on it, that's just the way that is but i think as long as it's done in a way where they're trying to you know ask a question where it's not conversation and they're, and they're genuinely putting you know why are we doing this or why are we doing that and you can tell them why players will, players will accept it and get on with it i, I think it, the days of just i will I, I did it or just do it that's not you have to educate them as well and if you if you constantly come back with you know that sort of aggressive tone of, well, I told you to do it, then you're not really, you know, it's not a really good environment to be working in. That is a great uh, segue to what you were saying earlier, Craig, about, you know, coaching the coach, educators, like in the coaches, because it relates to every level of football. Like, you know, it's, as Joe says, if someone says, you go do this, and I don't, I don't agree, I don't agree with this, I don't want to do it. Like, you know, it might be a mental thing, it might be a relationship thing, the tone in which it's said or whatever. But if we can actually change the how, the language of how it's been used. Definitely. Content. Definitely. And and especially with this type of content, Garrett, as well, that I, I think for you to gain buy-in, I think if you can make it relative to the game, um, I think players will automatically buy in straight away. I think if if you if you're if you're telling a the player they're doing an anaerobic run today for whatever reason, I, I think they'll they'll start to lose buy-in really quickly. But if you probably tell them that we're doing this type of practice today which will help you transition on Friday night I think they'll understand it more and they'll have a more of a of, of a relatable thought process of how it's going to help them on Friday because that that needs to be the process as well of I think for you to create an environment to show them that you're there for them and that if they question you that's no problem but you're going to give them the correct answers answers to make sure that it helps them on a Friday because that's that's what we're all ultimately here for and even especially with a grassroots coach we don't need to be filling our players with jargon and, and with, with scientific words and with big words mm-hmm. because they don't need it. They don't need to understand why they're doing that type of run. They need to understand why it helps them play on a Saturday because that's the biggest that's the biggest buy-in for them, that they understand, oh, I done that on Tuesday night because now it looks like this on a Saturday. Um, and I think, I think that will help the environment become a little bit more um, holistic probably mm-hmm. is, is probably the word I'd use. And players will buy in more and, and it'll be more enjoyable. So once it's more enjoyable for the players, it'll probably be more enjoyable for the coach as well because players are buying in and they're doing what they're asked, which is good. Treating is just another part of the football process is in the same way as you say, we work in a set piece because on a Tuesday night because we're going to implement it on a Saturday morning. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and it, it just becomes natural. It becomes natural. It, there's no there's no separation or isolation. And, that, and that's the point I wanted to make earlier on, that everything is done as a byproduct now. So we can sneak everything in together and everything is done done in tandem almost. And it's not, as you said earlier, Garrett, that you, Thursday was running day and everyone came in thinking, oh no, here we go. And when we see all the cones out on a Tuesday, it's, oh, we know it's running or whatever. It's not, it's all elements are sneaked in together and everything is trained as a byproduct of each other. The objective might be different of what we're trying to achieve. But the practices might look the same, um, and, and it might look like the game a lot of the time. But but our our objective or our, our learning outcomes might be different. So it's 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 the coach having the understanding of what he's trying to achieve come the end, um, and then making sure that happens. Because if we keep doing things in isolation, it, it, it will go back to your example of the Thursday night example of turning up at your boots and turning at the gate and going home because you know it's running day. Yeah. Right. Um, can I just ask in terms of? We mentioned the the coaching at uh, the football fitness uh, conference. Uh, you mentioned your study visit to Poland, and you know it's going to be part of the uh, coach education pathway going forward. Where where are we now in in relation to other countries with regard to football fitness? Do you think? Um, it, it was an eye opener for me when we went to Poland. So we were with some top nations there, and we were lucky enough to be exposed to some really really top nations. Um, nobody has anything from what I've seen nobody has anything in terms of a football fitness pathway as such 
And um, so I think we're <clears throat> I think we're gonna be ahead of the game and ahead of the curve on this. And um, that was really an eye opener for certainly for myself and Noel while we were sitting there saying nobody really has a full implementation process here of what they're trying to achieve. They may have elements of courses, they may have some grassroots stuff or but we're really going for it with five courses because we feel there's certainly an appetite for it in the country. We feel there's um, certainly the content is there that we, we can help our coaches with. So why not bring it all together and help our coaches? So I certainly think we're going to be ahead of the curve. I think we've some brilliant people in this country. I don't think we give ourselves enough credit throughout that. I think we've brilliant um, practitioners on the ground doing great work, whether it's through research whether it's through actually out on the ground, physically delivering this stuff through SNC, football coaches, physios, um, all, all that kind of medical area is, is brilliant in this country. We, we probably don't give ourselves enough credit. So we're certainly going to tap into that as much as we can and, and make use of it because I feel we're ahead of the curve and let's make sure that we stay ahead of the curve, not to use the pawn around the COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, brilliant insight there from Craig and Joe. Uh, really interesting stuff about how how football fitness is changing in the modern game, and and some really exciting stuff coming in terms of the coach education pathway as well. Um, I just want to say thanks very much for you two watching this webinar. I'd love to get some feedback from you as well. So uh, leave some comments on social media and make sure to subscribe to FEO TV on YouTube. Thanks very much. <laughs>